honors uh, this entire week. We've had blood drives scheduled at two high schools, but we just didn't get the blood types that we've needed. Ball Memorial Blood Bank issues an alert today. A part of their blood supply critically low. Now they're asking for your help. Good evening. It's 530. I'm Dustin Grove. The blood center says it desperately needs O positive and B positive blood. Today, hospital officials say they are, they are well below what they need. I think the supply is low because there have been a lot of colds and flu going around and people who normally would have donated just haven't been able to do so. To, to donate, you can go to Ball Memorial Hospital's Blood Bank weekdays from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on the second floor. The address, 2401 University Avenue. On to our other top story today. It's official. Ball State will be the first university to sponsor charter schools in state history. Beginning next year, Ball State will sponsor seven charter schools from around the state. That means the university will decide on each school's curriculum and make sure the schools are following state guidelines. But what exactly are charter schools and what are the benefits? Teachers College assistant Dean Ken Miller says they cost as much as public schools but with more freedom to choose curriculum. They have to demonstrate very graphically that each student enrolled in the school is making continuous educational progress and that the school as a whole is showing improvement. Okay. What is the benefit to charter schools? Well the benefit of, of charter schools is that it provides a choice, an option right, for parents uh, in terms of where they want to send their children to school. With each other for students, which will ensure better education. Drug testing could return to Muncie schools next year if administrators take advantage of Tuesday's state Supreme Court ruling. The high court decided drug testing is constitutional as long as students are randomly selected. In today's Star Press, Muncie Superintendent Marlon Creasy said he's not completely sure if he'll implement drug testing, but either way, he's happy to see the courts uphold the decision. Creasy says he believes random drug testing can be a deterrent for students who use drugs. Alpha Tau Omega fraternity officials say mounting financial troubles will force them to put their house up for sale. Chapter President Glenn Warren says fewer recruits played a part in the problem. The three-story house is appraised at $450,000. The money will go toward paying off the mortgage. Even though ATO will lose the house, they say they'll still keep their charter. 25 Plainfield High School seniors are suspended from school today after pulling an unusual prank. They jumped into the high school's indoor pool yesterday, fully clothed, all at the same time, and they did it as hundreds of other students watched. Also suspended for a week, a high school newspaper editor who didn't even get wet. He took pictures of the prank, and the principal says by doing that, the student encouraged doing that prank. Well, by the weather today, should have had an outdoor pool. They could have done it outside. Yeah, they could have done it outside. <laughs> nice day nice. outside. It is nice out there now, but we are seeing severe weather start to approach us. Mm -hmm. Um, around the area. We heard sirens yesterday and they were testing all of our sirens around Muncie. We have also seen the um, Delaware Storm Chase team is being assembled. We have been like meeting every once in a while to mm -hmm. talk about our strategy for doing that. And national and local TV stations have also been testing that, out yeah. their warning systems. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any severe weather outside tonight, but we may be seeing some in the future. Okay, look forward to your forecast coming up a little later. Right. Thanks, Katie. Changes at the Indiana State House could make your wallet a little thinner next year. A state budget deficit is forcing lawmakers to scramble to make up the differences. News Center's Amy Barnett explains on what could potentially be bad news for Hoosiers. It's tax time in Indiana, and while residents are filing for returns, the General Assembly is working on a plan that could affect next year's 1040s. The Senate has passed one bill and the House another version. Now they're headed to conference committee to work out the differences. It's going to be very tough um, for them to compromise in such a fashion that that bill can come out of conference and pass both the House and the Senate. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be an interesting process. Both the House and the Senate bills agree increases are needed on sales tax, cigarette tax, and riverboat gambling taxes. But the biggest difference may be with the homestead tax credit. The credit would save property owners money. Just how much money depends on which version is passed. The House version would raise the credit to 15 percent, while the Senate bill proposes 30 percent. Critics say the Senate bill doesn't do enough to solve the budget problems. It's really not, it's going to shift tax, taxes around. It's really not going to add additional revenue that can help with our projected shortfall. 
However lawmakers resolve the differences, time is running out. The legislative session ends March 15th. For New Center, I'm Amy Barnett. Business news now. It looks like tough times at Carmel-based Conseco are getting tougher. Stock continued to fall today as the insurance company's chief financial officer stepped down. The company continues trying to reduce its massive debt. Analysts say the departure is a significant negative development. Well, good news for Indiana's unemployment rate today. It dipped a tenth of a percent last month from 5.1 to 5 percent. This marks the first month-to-month -month decline in Indiana since last year. Just last February, Indiana enjoyed a 3 percent unemployment rate, but experts say Hoosiers were hit particularly hard in the recession because of our manufacturing-dependent economy. An Indianapolis woman says she didn't think about it before she used her SUV to stop a runaway car. 36-year-old Amy Powell just picked up her truck from the body shop when she noticed that boys in the car ahead of her were waving for help. The two other drivers also saw the children. One pulled up beside the car while the other one pulled in behind. That's when Powell parked in front of the car. While the drivers worked to pull the kids out of the car, it coasted into Powell's truck. The two boys were pulled to safety. Apparently, their mom had lost consciousness while driving. An Evansville hospital says it will settle two lawsuits filed over the death of a nine-month-old child. The child's family says his illness was misdiagnosed. St. Mary's Medical Center will pay the child's mother $250,000. It's the maximum amount for a health provider to pay under state law. The family's attorney says the settlement doesn't bring closure because the hospital still won't admit they made a mistake. Indianapolis police are still searching today for the suspect who shot and killed two young men on the city's west side last night. That tops our look at news, also making headlines from around the state. Police say about 11 o'clock last night, someone shot two men ages 16 and 19 several times. To New Albany now, where a former Indiana state trooper accused of killing his wife and two children testified in his own defense. David Cam says he returned home from a basketball game in September of 2000 to find his family dead. Cam was a state trooper for 10 years but quit four months before the shooting. And an Elkhart judge says City Hall can keep a Ten Commandments monument at the City Hall grounds. Yesterday, U.S. District Judge Alan Sharp said the city can keep a Ten Commandments monument in front of the building if it adds four other historical monuments beside it. And that wraps up a look at news making headlines around the state. An Iraqi delegation arrives in the U.S. for some high-level talks. We'll tell you what was on the table. Plus, Another emergency evacuation at Los Angeles International Airport today, the eighth time this week. What caused that delay? Coming up. Topping national news now, a bomb scare at Los Angeles International Airport forced hundreds of passengers to evacuate the airport. It happened this morning around 11 o'clock. The evacuation took about 20 minutes and everyone had to be re-screened once they returned to the terminals. This is the eighth evacuation at LAX in just eight days. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan says an upbeat economy could be on its way. He told Senate panel members today they can look forward to a recession recovery. But Greenspan is still cautious about the rebound. He says many influence, he says many influence could moderate, excuse me, moderate the speed of the recovery. In Chicago today, McDonald's says it is close to settling lawsuits from vegetarians who say the chain, the restaurant chain, used beef extract in French fries. The settlement means McDonald's would pay $10 million to support to charities that support vegetarians and it would also publicly apologize. McDonald's would also pay $2.4 million to the plaintiff's attorneys. From the Philippine jungles, new images tonight of an American couple taken hostage almost a year ago. That videotape indicates the kidnappers are linked to the Al-Qaeda terror network. Atika Schubert has the details on another chapter in the Al-Qaeda terror tale. Of Martin and Gracia Burnham held hostage now for more than 10 months. Their captors, a group called Abu Sayyaf, sending a message confirming their link to the terrorist group Al-Qaeda. The Burnham statement appeared to have been written for them. I, Martin Burnham, and my wife, Gracia, both U.S. citizens, were taken as captives on May 27, 2001, at the Dos Palmas Beach Resort in Palawan by the Al-Hadakatul Islamia, or the Abu Sayyaf Group. They are targeting U.S., European, and citizens of other Western nations for the following reasons. 
The statement Hawaii. listed five complaints against America, presence of U.S. troops and businesses in Saudi Arabia, home to Islam's most sacred places, U.S. support of Israel, sanctions against Iraq and Libya, and what the statement called America's indifference to the world's Muslim minorities, particularly in the Philippines. No demands were issued, but the rebel-released video leaves little doubt of the Abu Sayyaf's desire to ratchet up the pressure on U.S. efforts to win the Burnham's release. A worrying comparison to killed U.S. journalist Daniel Pearl. Once again, if we the Burnhams were last seen in a videotaped last season, November, several months after Christmas the Abu Sayyaf had beheaded a third American hostage last year. Since then, U.S. forces have arrived on Philippine soil to advise local fighters in what's been called phase two of the war on terror. No, no way. Uh, I made very clear that uh, the U.S. forces will not join the military, Philippine military in operations. They are just there to observe and stay in the headquarters to extend to us uh, some training to enhance our operations. This video puts increasing pressure on both the U.S. and Philippine militaries, and it begs the question, now that U.S. troops are here in the Philippines, will they take direct action to rescue the Burnhams? Atika Schubert, CNN, Zamboanga City, Philippines. Iraq and the United Nations are back at the table today talking weapons inspections. They're the most intense talks this year so far. Today, U.S. officials renewed accusations that Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein is illegally trying to build up Iraq's military. The U.N. is now demanding he allow weapons inspectors to return to Iraq before U.N. sanctions are lifted. No breakthroughs are expected today. A Palestinian suicide bomber exploded several bombs in a West Bank settlement today. Police say the blasts went off near a hotel there. They killed the bomber and wounded nine other people. This as Israeli forces launched several attacks against Palestinian positions. Helicopters filed missiles onto Palestinian offices where PLO leader Yasser Arafat was working. Arafat wasn't injured. Switching gears now, coming up on weather, and an A-plus in the weather department. You get an A. It was absolutely fabulous outside today. It was. And everybody took advantage of it. We had just people sitting outside, hanging out, talking. We had people outside rollerblading. Mm -hmm. I even saw some shorts go by. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but um, I'm not necessarily sure that that's going to continue. And after the break, I will return with that. OK. While well, temperatures were well above normal today, our high today was 57. Our normal high is 43. And today's low, it, well, it wasn't 21 degrees. Our low was more like 43. And normal lows for this time of year is 36. Um, sunrise tomorrow morning is going to be at 7.08. And sunset will be at 6.39 tonight. For our highs around the area, we saw 45 at South Bend um, 40, 57 at Fort Wayne. Muncie today, again, 58. Indianapolis at 60. Lafayette and Terre Haute both saw 59 at Evansville at 60. Currently outside, um, actually, currently it is more like 58 degrees. We are seeing winds around 9 miles per hour, not 13. And for our satellite picture, we can see that we really aren't in the clouds yet, but they will be moving into our area. The cloud cover is going to come in from the Montana area. It's going to come on down into the state, and we will be seeing significant cloud cover as of tomorrow morning. For regional, okay, for radar, we are seeing only some rain out here in California, Oregon, and Washington. And for our area, we really aren't seeing anything right now. However, we may be seeing some more rain tomorrow night, maybe into Saturday. Tonight, we are going to see a um, high pressure area move through us. The low pressure is what's following us, and the low pressure is what's going to bring in the rain. Tonight's lows, we are going to actually see 30 degrees tonight, um, 40s and 50s just to the south of us. At least we're not up here in the 10s and zeros. For tonight, it's going to be mostly cloudy. We're going to see a low of right around 40 degrees, winds going to be southwest, 8 to 12 miles per hour. And for tomorrow morning, it's going to be partly sunny. And we're going to see more clouds move in as the day goes on. Temperatures should be 42 degrees tomorrow morning. 
Tomorrow's highs, again, we will be in the 50s. It's gonna be another absolutely beautiful day. Just to the south of us, we will see some 60s. Maybe they'll creep up into our area, we can always hope. But to the north of us, they will be seeing 20s and 30s. For tomorrow, again, increasing clouds, high of 53 degrees, winds going to be west at 15 miles per hour. And for our three day, we are looking at clouds and some rain. And actually, it's going to be raining on Saturday, and Sunday and Monday will actually be somewhat sunny. So, wow. but the temperatures are going to drop on Saturday night. So Sunday, we may not even see the temperatures get out of the 30s. Okay, well, we're still, uh Got to enjoy this weekend then. Huh? Right. Well, you got to wear your shorts today. Absolutely. You know it. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Well, talking about what? Basketball, I guess? Lots of up? basketball. The MAC championships are in our midst for both the women and men. Uh, the women did something that only one other Ball State team has done, and uh, we'll have more of, of that coming up after the break. Last night in Cleveland, Ball State's women's team did something that only one other Cards team has ever done. Thanks to an unconscious defensive performance against Eastern Michigan, the team destroyed the Eagles 23-57. BSU held EMU to a miserable 17 points and only 25% shooting in the first half. Tamara Bowie led the team with 19 points and three others, Shayla Crooks, Jessica Ryder and Jonah Goff all chipped in double figures in points. The first and last time a Ball State team advanced to the semis was 1990. They'll play for a chance to go to the MAC Championship Friday afternoon at 2.30 in Gund Arena against the winner of the Toledo Northern Illinois game. On the other hand, the men's team might not have it so easy later tonight. They will face a di an always difficult Miami team for the first game of the MAC tournament in Cleveland. The Red Hawks handed the Cardinals an 80-77 loss in Oxford against Oxford in January. The Cardinals rebounded last month to thrash Miami 74 to 58 at home. This game is extremely important considering many experts believe BSU will have to win the MAC tournament for an NCAA tournament berth. Tip-off will be at 7 tonight at Gund Arena. And there were many key matchups in the top 25 today. Let's start with number 7 Pittsburgh and Boston College, shall we? Despite the tremendous 25-point performance by BC's Uka Agbai, the Cardinals fell to the Big East leading Pitt Panthers this afternoon. The win gives Pittsburgh an incredible 26-4 record. Also this afternoon, 25 and 29 point performances by Louisville's Luke Whitehead and Reese Gaines were not enough to top the number 10 Marquette. The loss drops Rick Pitino's boys to an 18 and 12 record, which will be very difficult for a tournament invite. It took overtime for 23rd ranked Xavier to put down UMass in the A-10 tournament today. Romain Sato had a huge performance in the 65-59 XU win. Xavier is perhaps the only A-10 team with a lock on a tournament spot. And also on the slate tonight, number 18 Stanford takes, a 20, takes on number 20 USC, and South Florida looks for an upset against the fifth-ranked UC Bearcats at 7. Also at 7, Big East rivals Villanova and UConn tip off. At 7.30, Auburn squares off against the 12th-ranked Florida Gators. And for you insomniacs out there, there's an Arizona State against Arizona matchup, and UCLA tries to upset California really late tonight. And the big boys come out to play starting tomorrow. The Big Ten tournament kicks off on ESPN2 at 1.30 on Friday afternoon, and the AC tur ACC tournament also begins on ESPN tomorrow at noon. The Big East tournament continues throughout the day on Friday and beginning at 11.30 on ESPN2. And this time of the year brings a lot of confusion to who's in and who's out, and this might help a little bit. As of right now, 12 of the 64 teams are in via conference champions, championships. Three more teams were added last night, and with a big win over IUPUI on ESPN last night, Valpo is in. Illinois Chicago took out Chi-Town rival Loyola Chicago last night to punch their ticket to the big dance. And also, the Hilltoppers of Western Kentucky stomped on Louisiana Lafayette last night to clinch their conference championship for a second year in a row. Florida Atlantic, Winthrop, UNC Wilmington, Siena Creighton, Central Connecticut State, Murray State, Davidson, and Gonzaga are the other nine teams penciled in for the brackets. 
That's a lot of names, a lot of lists, and a lot of teams, huh? I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, don't blame you. You gonna watch some basketball this weekend? Of course, of course. <laughs> okay, coming up, Katie Collins will be back with your weekend weather recap, and the Baltimore Zoo gets a big present from Alaska. Find out what we mean, coming up. Okay, we're going to take one last look at what we're going to be seeing this weekend. For tonight, it's going to be mostly cloudy, low of 45 degrees, southwest wind of 11 miles per hour. For tomorrow, we should be seeing some more clouds moving into the area. We're going to see temperatures around 50 degrees in the morning. For tomorrow afternoon, we're going to see a high of 64. We do have a possibility for some thunderstorms tomorrow evening. And for our 3D outlook, we are looking at rain on Saturday and sun on Sunday and Monday, but some cold temperatures Sunday will be warming back up come Monday. Okay, look forward to it. Thanks, Katie. Here's a warm and fuzzy story for you. A female bear named Alaska was taken uh, from a circus in Puerto Rico last year and made her perform in the tropical heat. Not good for her, obviously, but U.S. Fish and Wildlife officials brought Alaska back to the U.S. She'll be now at the Baltimore Zoo, her new home. Of course, visitors to the zoo will be happy to see her, but I imagine not nearly as happy who is the zoo's male polar bear. He'll be happy for that one. Coming up all new at 9.30 tonight, more on what you can do to help Ball Memorial Hospital's blood shortage. Plus, Milan Willie has your spring break forecast and what you'll see in tomorrow's edition of the Ball State Daily News. Those stories and more tonight on News Center at 9.30. Thanks for joining us at 5.30. We'll see you back here tonight for News Center at 9.30. See you then.